This is China's Lus Plateau. Until recently, this was one of the poorest regions in the country. A land renowned for floods, mudslides, and famine. But with the fanfare comes the hope of change for the better. My name is John D. Liu. I've been documenting the changes on the plateau for 15 years. <laughs> I first came here in 1995 to film an ambitious project where local people were constructing a new landscape on a vast scale. Transforming a barren land into a green and fertile one. The project certainly changed my life, convincing me to become a soil scientist. The lessons I've learned in the last few years have made me realize that many of the human tragedies that we regularly witness around the world, the floods, mudslides, droughts, and famines are not inevitable. Here on the Lus Plateau, I've witnessed that people can lift themselves out of poverty. They can radically improve their environment and by doing so, reduce the threat of climate change. When I first came to the Lus Plateau, I was astounded by the degree of poverty and degradation. And I wondered, how could the Chinese people the largest ethnic group on the planet, and my father's and my own ancestors, come from a place that was this barren. China's Lus Plateau is a region that stretches for 640,000 square kilometers across north-central China. Unspoilt valleys in neighboring Sichuan show us how it might once have looked. It's the sort of natural abundance that is necessary to support an emerging civilization. How could a landscape with such potential have been reduced to this? When Chinese scientists and civil engineers began to survey the area, they realized that several thousand years of agricultural exploitation had denuded the hills and valleys of vegetation. The relentless grazing of domestic animals on the slopes meant that there was no chance for young trees and shrubs to grow. The rainfall no longer seeped into the earth, but simply washed down the hillsides, taking the soil with it. Over millennia, this progressively destroyed the region's fertility.
When this happens over an area as extensive as the plateau, millions of tons of silt are swept down into the Yellow River, which gets its name from the color of the fine loose soil. The mounting quantities of silt clog up the river, impeding its flow, contributing to the floods that give the river another name, China's Sorrow. In some areas, creating floating mud mattresses that attract passing tourists. A local problem becomes a national problem. In the dry season, the light, unprotected soil is swept up in the winds, causing the dust storms that are blown over China's cities and beyond its borders. On the plateau, the researchers realized that progressive degradation of the environment trapped the local population into a life of subsistence farming. It's a process that has occurred throughout the world where poor agricultural communities find themselves overusing their land in order to survive, depleting its fertility and further impoverishing themselves. One thing that became apparent early on is the connection between damaged environments and human poverty. In many parts of the world, there's been a vicious cycle. Continuous use of the land has led to subsistence agriculture. And generation by generation, this has further degraded the soils. The vital question we have to ask is, can this destructive process be reversed? <laughs> Fifteen years ago, Chinese and international experts were confident it could be. They decided that to prevent further erosion, it was necessary to cease farming on certain key areas to allow the trees and shrubs to grow back. But this could not happen without the consent of the farmers themselves. They took some persuading. Of course, a lot of people didn't understand the project. They weren't thinking in the long term. They want us to plant trees everywhere. Even in the good land. What about the next generation? They can't eat trees. What eventually convinced the local people was the assurance that they would have tenure of their land, that they would directly benefit from the effort they invested in the new project. The goal was to give a hat to the hilltops, give a belt to the hills as well as shoes at the base. The hat meant that the top of these hills had to be replanted with trees. The belt meant that terraces had to be built to be used for crop planting and also for trees. The shoes were the dams which we had to build so that the hills could grow back to life and our economy, as well as our lives, could improve. Hills and gullies were designated as ecological zones to be protected. Farmers were given financial compensation for not farming on them and keeping their livestock pinned up. When I first filmed Mr. Ta Fu Yuan and his colleagues back in 1995, I had no idea this initiative could achieve such dramatic results. The effort that people put into converting their slopes into terraces has resulted in a marked increase in agricultural productivity. The higher yields 
are directly related to the return of natural vegetation in the surrounding ecological land. Now when it rains, the water no longer runs straight off the slopes. Trapped by the vegetation, it sinks into the ground where it is retained in the soil, taking weeks and months to gently seep down and irrigate the fields and terraces below. Restoration has occurred over an area of 35,000 square kilometers. The impact of such an enormous addition of vegetation goes far beyond the plateau itself. There's been a significant reduction in the soil rushing down into the Yellow River. As I've been traveling around the Lust Plateau, I've seen extensive changes. The vegetation cover on the hillsides, on the tops of the hills, and down in the valley, everything has changed. It's changed the lives of the people. And in fact, the people themselves have done this because they were the ones who, who changed their behaviors, terraced the fields, improved the soils, learned to protect the marginal areas. The changes are not simply on the hillsides. On the plains, you can see greenhouses that are filled with vegetables. This extends the growing season. It's very high value produce. The abundance and variety of new produce can be seen in the local market. Follow-up studies have shown that incomes have risen threefold. And scientists point to a more global benefit. Plants, through photosynthesis, remove carbon from the air, countering the effect of human greenhouse gas emissions on the climate. In terms of climate change, we can say that the project made a double contribution. Firstly, the project was successful in restoring vegetation on a large scale. As a result of its success, the lessons learned from the Lus Plateau rehabilitation are now being applied all over China. But could such projects work elsewhere in less centrally controlled societies with fewer resources and different soils? Ethiopia, perhaps more than any other country, has come to symbolize the vulnerability of humankind to environmental catastrophe. This is a country whose problems have been increased by war and civil conflict. And now, human-induced climate change is predicted to make matters worse. As on the Lus Plateau, centuries of subsistence farming practices have stripped the land of natural vegetation. The dry gullies bear the scars of flash floods. These gullies are evidence of the enormous power of runoff during the rainy season. Without vegetation cover on the hillsides, when the rains come, the water doesn't soak into the ground but flows away in a flood. Then it's not available for agriculture during the rest of the year. This leads to drought and famously for Ethiopia, famine. But just as I've witnessed in China, there is hope that the situation here can be reversed. Yeah, that route could survive? No. no, no in just six survive. years, Professor Lagessa Nagash and local villagers have transformed a severely eroded terrain by planting indigenous trees and plants. Almost miraculously, a clear flowing stream has emerged where once there was a muddy trickle. How is it that it's possible for you to get the stream to flow throughout the year? It is because of the vegetation cover, which has been regenerating on this mountain. This water is maintained in the landscape because as soon as rain falls, 
on the canopy on this vegetation, that rain then infiltrated gradually into the ground, ending up with this steady flow of this river. Water is life. Without water, nobody can do anything. I'm amazed, as short as five years, six years, you get clean water like this, provided you work hard for restoring this degraded landscape. About a thousand kilometers further north, in the village of Abraha Aspaha, another near miraculous phenomenon is occurring. Farmers are finding water at the bottom of their wells, despite the poor rains this year. The famine of 1984 struck the people of this valley very hard. Many migrated, many died. Now the people are returning. and international. Environmental degradation is not only a problem for the dry regions of Ethiopia. It can be just as devastating for countries like Rwanda, where rainfall is plentiful. This tiny country is grappling with the problem of a growing population trying to eke out a living on a finite amount of land. As in China and Ethiopia, over-farming on the hillsides caused serious erosion and a decline in fertility, forcing poor farmers to move into protected areas, such as the Rugezi wetlands, a wildlife site of international importance. When farmers drained this marsh to try to grow more food, they not only damaged an important wetland ecosystem, they also had a significant impact three hours drive away in Kigali, the capital city. The water that pours from the marshlands is a vital source of hydropower for Rwanda's capital. As the wetlands began to dry out, power stations below couldn't generate enough electricity. The Rwandan government rented diesel power generators to make up the shortfall. And improve the productivity. The most important thing is to have people with you on your side. The wetlands are now recovering. Great volumes of water once again cascade down to power the hydro stations. Carbon-free electricity is replacing the diesel generators. Electricity prices have stabilized. Restoring and preserving natural ecosystems like the Rugezi wetlands benefits everyone. And so much more could be achieved. If we had more involvement by different institutions coming in to help with their available resources. The times we live in can feel pretty bleak. We believe better days are on the way. Because there's her, and him, and them, and you. By switching search engines from Google to Ecosia, people across the world have planted 50 million trees. And these trees have absorbed 2.5 million tons of toxic CO2 from our atmosphere. But they are doing so much more. Ecosia users have planted a living sanctuary for those of us who have no place left to go. In Madagascar, Brazil, and Uganda, we're planting trees to reconnect isolated patches of forest. These living bridges let lemurs, chimpanzees, and jaguars forage for food and search for mates 
without having to cross dangerous human territory. But the 50 million trees Ecosia users have planted are not just restoring the forests we've lost. They're also protecting the ones that we can't afford to lose. In Borneo, we've planted a wall of trees around Mount Sauron to help prevent 25,000 hectares of pristine orangutan habitat from being turned into a sterile palm oil monoculture. And the native fruit and nut trees we plant there, as well as in Morocco and Haiti, provide a steady income to the farmers who care for them and an enduring shelter for those who find refuge in their branches. Climate change isn't just affecting wildlife. Time and again, the farmers we work with around the world are telling us that the seasons are out of sync. That harvests are less reliable and that providing for a family is harder than it used to be. But there's something else people are telling us. Trees are restoring water supplies and soil fertility. They are tempering winds and floods, and they are providing more dependable, diverse, and plentiful harvests. On Makata's farm in northern Ghana, they are a vital source of fruit and shea nuts. Trees Mame has grown around her field in Senegal create a shady microclimate to protect her okra and peppers from dry winds and hungry animals. In Uganda, they replenish Joram's well with clean water. In southern Spain, Belen and Leo's trees have transformed a barren desert into fertile soil. Makada, Mame, Joram, Belen and Leo, and all the other farmers we work with in Colombia, Nicaragua, Tanzania, Kenya, and Burkina Faso are living proof that conservation and agriculture can coexist. We never have to choose between forests and fields. Together, 50 million trees can cool our planet, and every single one of them has the power to change lives. By restoring water supplies, revitalizing degraded soil, and protecting crops, Ecosia's forests are increasing harvests, and in some cases even doubling them. More food means better health, and smallholder farmers can sell their surplus to support themselves and their families. Almas can pay for her children's school fees in Dila, Ethiopia. And on the banks of the Dhaka River in Ghana, Paul can take care of his elders. Meanwhile, in the Sahel region of Senegal, Mr. and Mrs. Sek now have the means to cover their family's medical bills. High in the Peruvian Andes, Felipe can start saving money. While further inland, Oswaldo can afford to transition away from the narcotics trade and build a sustainable coffee and cacao plantation that brings peace to the community. To maintain this cycle of positive change, Ecosia's local partners are teaching the next generation how vital trees are to their livelihoods, how throughout the world, women and youth are taking the lead in reforesting their lands, and how trees represent our last and only chance of preventing catastrophic climate change. When the world forgets this, our outlook can seem bleak. But we believe that by leading the way as a tree-planting, purpose-driven, transparent, privacy-focused, tax-paying, not-for-profit company, better times are on the way. Because there's her, and him, and them, and you. San Joaquin Valley, one of the most agriculturally poorly patterned landscapes 
of squares, grid lines, irrigation, and mostly chemical agricultural eroded, depleting. This is mainstream America. Car culture, road culture, but 100% runoff of water. Clever design, simple little features. Capturing that stormwater here with a conventional system goes straight into unconventional food abundance by the way we design that water capture. Not waste and runoff, not dump and extract, but actually deposit. So in here, I get down in this drain here, and here it is. Here's the pipe. There. The water's here. It's actually storm water sitting there, soaking in. And we're in midsummer, and yet it's damp here, captured in food systems throughout the human settlement. Very sensible and should be the only way we settle land. Swales and road catch together underneath a footbridge and on down hydrating green space through the suburb. So the roads here are really multifunctional here. The curb is designed to pick up the water, passively run it down over these rocks and it joins the swale water and becomes a benefit to the landscape. First year, the measurements gave about three feet, one meter, of hydrated soil below these swales. In the second year, it was eight to nine feet, about three meters of not saturated, but dampened geology, dampened subsoil below these swales. And in the third year, there was 18 feet of dampened soil and subsoil below the subdivision. So we started here to rehydrate the landscape, perch and aquifer. And once you get nine meters of dampened hydrology in this climate, you can grow any trees within the temperature range. There's no point in measuring anymore. You've got everything you need in the moisture rehydration of this landscape. Pomegranates, figs, citrus, I'm surrounded by fruit. I'm surrounded by food on the ground. This is everything that I teach. This is everything that I say is possible. Here it is in reality, 30 years old. This is a model. You cannot purchase this. You cannot plant 30 year old trees. Doesn't matter how much wealth you have, this is the true wealth of abundance within human settlement. This is what we need to realize is possible. Here it is, we need to extend it.
I'm in the flat bottom land here, kind of a penny plain in the Sonora Desert, and it's not much fertility around. It's pretty sparse vegetation actually. And this here is an 80-year-old swale bank put in in the Great Depression in the Roosevelt era. And it's a big one. And as I walk over the top, then you see this obvious event starts to happen. The trees get green and big, and the vegetation gets really lush. And this is something you need to really understand. It's not every day that you see a scene like this, an oasis of lush verdant green, created by nature, facilitated by good design. We can speed up ecosystem regeneration while even saving some money. So The deforestation, especially for oil palm, to provide biofuel for the Western countries is what's causing these problems. And those are the peat swamp forest on 20 meters of peat, the largest accumulation of organic material in the world. When you open this for growing oil palms, you're creating CO2 volcanoes that are emitting so much CO2 that my country is now the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world after China and the United States. And we don't have any industry at all, but also a solution that will benefit the people that are trying to exploit those forests to get their hands on the last timber and that are causing in that way the loss of habitat and all those victims. So I created a place, some Stari, and the idea was if I can do this on the worst possible place that I can think of, where there's really nothing left, no one will have an excuse to say, yeah, but no. Everyone should be able to follow this. So we're in East Borneo and this is the place up there where I started. As you can see, there's only yellow terrain. There's nothing left, just a bit of grass there. In 2002, we had about 50% of the people jobless there. There was a huge amount of crime. People spent so much of their money on health uh, issues and on drinking water. There was no agricultural productivity left. This was the poorest district in the whole province. And it was a total extinction of wildlife. This was like a biological desert. When I stood there in the grass, it's hot, not even the sound of insects, just this waving grass. Still, four years later, we have created jobs for about 3,000 people. The climate has changed. I will show you the climate has changed. No more flooding, no more fires. It's no longer the poorest district. And there is a huge development of biodiversity. We've got over a thousand tree species. We have 137 bird species as of today. We have 30 species of reptiles. So what happened here? And we created a huge economic value in this forest. So basically, the whole process of destruction had gone a bit slower than what is happening now with the oil palm. But we saw the same thing. We had slash and burn agriculture. People cannot afford the fertilizer, so they burn the trees and have the minerals available there. The fires become more frequent. And after a while, you're stuck with an area of land where there is no fertility left, there is no trees left. Still, in this place, in this grassland, where you see our very first office there on that hill, four years later, there's this one green blob on the Earth's surface. And there's all these animals, and there's all these people happy, and there's this economic value. So how is this possible? It was quite simple. If you look at the steps, we bought the land, we dealt with the fire, and then only we started doing the reforestation by cutting a ring of sugar palms around the area. These sugar palms turn out to be fire resistant, also flood resistant, by the way, and they provide a lot of income for local people. This is how it looks like. 
the people have to tap them twice a day, just a millimeter of slice, and the only thing you harvest is sugar water, carbon dioxide, rainfall, and a little bit of sunshine. In principle, you make those trees into biological photovoltaic cells, and you can create so much energy from this because they produce three times more energy per hectare per year because you can tap them on a daily basis. You don't need to harvest organs than any other of the crops. So this is the combination where we have... I just followed nature, and nature doesn't know monocultures, but a natural forest has multi-layers. That means that both in the ground and above the ground, it can make better use of the available light. It can store more carbon in the system. It can provide more functions, but it's more complicated. It's not that simple, and you have to work with the people. So what we do is also, just like nature, we grow fast planting trees, and underneath that, we grow the slower growing primary rainforest trees of a very high diversity that can optimally use that light. And then what is just as important, get the right fungi in there that will grow into those leaves, bring back the nutrients to the roots of the trees that have just dropped that leaf within 24 hours. And they become like nutrient pumps. So you need the bacteria to fix nitrogen and Without those microorganisms, you won't have any performance at all. And then we started planting, only a thousand trees a day. We could have planted many, many more, but we didn't want to, because we wanted to keep the number of jobs stable. We didn't want to lose the people that uh, are going uh, to work in that plantation. And we do a lot of work here. We use indicator plants to look what soil types or what vegetables will grow, but what trees will grow here. And we have monitored every single one of those trees from space. This is what it looks like in real. You have this irregular ring around it with strips of 100 meter wide with sugar palms that can provide income for 648 families. It's only a small part of the area. The nursery in here is quite different. If you look at the number of tree species we have in Europe, for instance, from the Ural up to England, you know how many? 165. In this nursery, we are going to grow 10 times more the number of species. Can you imagine? You do need to know what you are working with. But it's that diversity which makes it work, that you can go from this zero situation by planting the vegetables and the trees, or directly the trees in the lines in that grass there, putting up that buffer zone, producing your compost, and then making sure that at every stage of that upgrowing forest, there are crops that can be used. In the beginning, maybe pineapples and beans and corn. In the second phase, there will be bananas and papayas. Later on, there will be chocolate and chilies. And then slowly, the trees start taking over, bringing in produce from the fruits, from the timber, from the fuel wood. And finally, the sugar palm forest takes over and provides the people with permanent income. It's after one year, and this is after two years. And that's green. If we look from the tower, this is when we start attacking the grass. We plant in the seedlings, mixed with the bananas, the papayas, all the crops for the local people. But the trees are growing up fast in between as well. And three years later, 137 species of birds are living here. So we lowered the air temperature, 3 to 5 degrees Celsius. The air humidity is up 10%. Cloud cover, I'm going to show it to you, is up, rainfall is up, and all these species and income. This eco-lodge that I built there, three years before, was an empty yellow field. This transponder, we operate with... USDA and RCS shows up to 0.75 inches for 5% precipitation, 29-inch snow depth, December to January 2015-16. Utah's reservoirs were only at 4 to 15% full through 2016, with a five-year interval record high temps expected to continue. National Weather Service states it is driving the drought to continue. It's 92 degrees out, and they're watering instead of in the evening when it's cooler. This is how we waste water. The city of Orem, while they charge us three times as much for water, where we're just trying to grow food and teach at our school how to do water conservation in the long run to sell sustainability. This is just what they don't care. Perfect example, they don't care if they waste water. It's sad. We almost wiped it out. 
by becoming reliant on very extractive pumps, extracting the groundwater, diverting the river. To the extent that we actually killed our river, we dropped our groundwater table over 300 feet. So we didn't bleak solar oven-like experience. And we found a, a lot of our neighbors didn't know one another. You just didn't want to be out here. I, mean, I said, look, the water situation's so bad in my community, I want to leave, where, where should I go? And he slapped me on the shoulder and said, you can't go. If you run away from your problems, you'll just plant problems everywhere you go. You got to go home, set your roots deeper than you ever thought possible, and figure out solutions. And so we organized what has become an annual tree planting project. As a neighborhood, we've all come together to plant over 1,400 trees in the neighborhood since 1996. So that's great planting trees, but we wanted to take it further because we were also wanting to push a regenerative system, you know, not just something that's sustainable, but something that can regenerate itself and get better over time. So when we were looking to what to plant, we looked to the ethnobotanical record. The way we water all this is not by bringing in plastic pipe, but we plant it within or beside these basins. So when it rains, the rain is the primary irrigator of our landscapes. We just got an inch and a quarter of rain in about 30 minutes. Here, we have a water harvesting chicane or a pull out that comes out into the street, narrows the street. That is full of water. So there's that basin, it filled up. When we started to cut right by where the lizard is, we yeah. cut the street curb to make an inlet for the water flowing along the street gutter to get into the street side tree. And create a basin in the earth between the curb and sidewalk that can capture some of that water. And right next to that we have uh, plants planted, their base of the trees are high and dry, but their roots are soaking up that water. And here's what it, uh, that site looks like after about a year. So over that time, water's been coming in off the street, sinking into the ground, getting cleaned by the soil and the plant roots and the microbes. And those trees are growing and they're shading the sidewalk. They're beautifying the neighborhood. They're shading where you park your car. For about a decade or 15 years, this is not a mile and a half from here in the Dunbar Spring neighborhood at Brad Lancaster's house. This isn't the Tucson Botanical Gardens. This is a sidewalk in a Tucson neighborhood that collects stormwater from the street to grow vegetation. The city of Tucson's getting in on the game as well. Uh, major innovators in this area. This is Scott Avenue just a few blocks away. Cap the, both sides of the street have little curb cuts to feed uh, with stormwater street trees along both sides of the street. It's a beautiful sort of capstone downtown project. Check it out. So, I mean, you're catching quite a bit of water. We are catching really good. So it's going over the sidewalk, running down, and going inside the pipe right there. And then over to the other end of the pipe, and it's coming out perfectly. Right there, you see the water. So it does work, you guys. Good job, Joshua. There it is, you guys. We have water from the roof all the way to the top of the garden. Woohoo! It works, Joshua. Wow. Isn't that beautiful, you guys? Listen to that. Yeah. <laughs> I need rainfall, my friend. <laughs> this is beautiful, Joshua. Thank you so much for teaching us how to do this right. Woo! That's exciting. What do you guys I think? think? That's going to happen. What do you guys think, Rick? You going to get one of these off your roof? Oh, yeah. Andy? Plan, yeah. Andy's ordering an IBC. Travis? More than likely, yes! We got to harness that rainfall, don't we? We shouldn't be wasting what precious drinking water we have when we're in moderate to severe drought in Utah right now. The water really comes down up there. Okay. It's just pouring in there beautifully. And that's just off one side gutter. Gravity and literally coming down and then along this pipe. 
up through the garden to the highest point on the garden. Okay, here we go. So, I gotta keep this under. Look at that water coming from there and down in the infiltration basins. So, we'll have to see how well they drain. Look at that. We're getting so much water is going right over the spillways and right down into the next ones. That's pretty amazing, guys. That's how infiltration basins work. Look at that. Wow. That's beautiful. Hatches there, comes down, elbows, and then all level through here. Same thing on this side, comes down from here and goes up to the top. Our demo food forest classroom garden has 59 fruit and nut trees, 32 kinds of berry bushes, hundreds of herbs, uh, root crops, and support plants that will live on only on rain when established, which takes about 10 years. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Wow. We teach them to design when we're here. We have seven systems in this garden. One is rainwater harvesting off the roof. So if you don't want to use any power, you just want to use gravity, make sure that where you're catching it at the bottom of the gutter up there is higher than where the highest point of where you want it to go to. Okay, so this is the highest point in the, gar the garden. So we use a three inch PVC field system that catches it up there, brings it underground to a pipe into this container. And last Tuesday when we had all the rain, it was pouring out. So we do what's designed in Tucson, Arizona as infiltration basins. We'll mulch these. We just put this one in, but we'll add straw, mulch them in so the water doesn't evaporate. And all this wetness from the last rainstorm will stay in there and soak into the roots. And that's another system that we use rainwater. To water our garden. This is a bean. This is th what? It, say that again. How much has it grown this year? This bean well, tree. Well, from that yeah. spot where it started growing this yeah. year, all the way to the top. Uh -huh. To me, that looks like well, that one there is almost like four feet of growth. In and one you've year. never seen that before. No. <laughs> you get like maybe two. Wow. That's crazy. Isn't that crazy? How everything is growing well, so fast. Look at my there, apricot. All the way to there, that like we trimmed back. Right there. Yep. And we trimmed that back so much with Grant. Yep. 